So um, thank you to uh, uh, James and Oliver uh, and everybody here at EUI for inviting me. I uh, really appreciate being here. Uh, it's a great honor to be uh, giving the Max Weber lecture. Um, and I uh, hope uh, uh, that uh, what I uh, have to say um, might be of interest to you. I've tried to make it as sort of broad as possible, so it's less focused on my exact research these days than on kind of broad themes that have motivated a lot of my interests uh, more generally about globalization. Um, before I start, let me just say I was, I was trying to think about what, um, what Max Weber would have to say about the world that we live in today. And um, I think in many ways he would, um, he'd find it very interesting and in, and in some strange ways very recognizable to, to the period that he was um, living and, and, and experiencing and, and writing about. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, he dies in 1920, so this is uh, really at the turn of the century, he's facing a world of very rapid technological change, the kind of second industrial revolution is talked about in this period. He's facing one of uh, rising globalization, um, but challenges beginning to that period of rising globalization. And he's facing a period in which the great powers are changing and um, increasingly competing with one another. Um, and the breakdown of international cooperation that uh, was maintained through the 19th century, um, in part, is starting to fall apart. Um, and I think that um, many of these trends you can see reflected in what's happening today. Uh, and I think that his diagnosis, if you remember, of disenchantment, that many publics were disenchanted with the world that they were entering, this world of uh, very rationalized uh, 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 institutions, uh, political and economic institutions, uh, international institutions as well as domestic ones, and the disenchantment that publics were facing. Uh, leading to, after his death, of course, this very turbulent period of the interwar years. Um, and I hope that um, perhaps we've learned from history and we won't have to go through a period like that again, um, of war, of you know, 20 years, 30 years of war, conflict, depression, um, and, and many uh, uh, sort of you know, turnbacks uh, and, and setbacks for, uh, I think, the human population overall. Um, so hopefully we have learned from it, um, and we have learned from Max Weber's own works, uh, and that his, uh, uh, his works and other social scientists' works since then will keep us from entering another period that is uh, that disruptive. We will see. <laughs> um, so let me talk to you uh, about uh, globalization and um, uh, a little bit on the history of globalization in this period, um, a bit on the sources of why we got globalization, and then a bit on the, uh, some of the consequences of globalization. Um, the, uh, the question that I, I, in a sense, am interested in asking and have been for a while is globalization going to persist? And as you can tell from the introductory remarks I just made um, about uh, uh, Weber's time uh, and after his time, um, uh, this is, a, I think, a very important question because we had a period before where we were very highly globalized and we turned back from that. So it is not uh, impossible that we wouldn't uh, once again retreat from globalization. Um, the, uh, so, as I said, I wanted to talk first about um, what has actually been happening in terms of globalization, what it is, what it means, um, what's been happening, um, why did it uh, uh, take off in the, uh, 18, uh, in the 1980s uh, onward, um, and then uh, what have been some of the consequences since then. Um, so globalization, as um, I talk about it, is really uh, e the economic side of globalization. There are lots of political and social elements to globalization. But what I want to focus on is the economic side, which um, ideally for a, 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 a totally globalized world would be one in which you have a single unified world market. There would be a law of one price, which would mean that, you know, if you follow that uh, uh, economist McDonald's hamburgers index, the price of a, a McDonald's hamburger all around the world would be identical, um, given uh, exchange rates and things like that. Um, and uh, this would mean, this would ha um, have enormous impacts on the price of capital and labor across the world because they also would be equalized uh, in this ideal, typical, sort of uh, 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 fully globalized world. We do not live in that type of world right now. There are still many barriers um, to a fully uh, unified world market, but we're much closer to that than we were 20 or 30 years ago.
Um, the, there are different um, elements of globalization, of economic globalization, and I'll talk about each one of those. Um, there's trade in goods and services. There's capital flows of a variety of sorts, uh, including foreign direct investment, foreign aid, uh, and uh, uh, portfolio flows. There's also the flows of labor. Uh, migration and immigration that I'm going to talk about, um, and uh, a little bit on, on foreign aid. And what I want to show you in a series of graphs and charts is that globalization grew very rapidly for a period of about 20 or 30 years, and um, uh, in effect, since the financial crisis, globalization has tapered off and it slowed down. So even though we may feel like we're in a period of sort of hyper-globalization when things are becoming more and more globalized, um, we've actually for the last five to 10 years been slowing down in this uh, uh, process. And given the recent um, sort of trade wars and other things that are starting, um, these data, which these data probably don't reflect, we're actually starting in some ways probably to reverse uh, on globalization. So this is the uh, one of the globalization indexes that's been um, produced. Uh, this is an economic component of it, which measures all sorts of different uh, economic flows, as I said, um, trade, capital, and labor flows. Um, and what you see here is that um, for the whole world, that's the dark uh, line in the middle. Um, for the developing countries, which is most of the world, uh, it's a little bit there less globalized than the developed countries, which are, which are at the top. Um, and as you'll see, for the period at the end of the Cold War to the beginning of the financial crisis, there's a pretty substantial rise in globalization. Um, but after that financial crisis, things begin to taper off. Um, what I want to, when I talk about the developed and the developing world, um, the kind of global north and the global south, uh, this is really what I mean, which is um, the original sort of 20 or so, 2023 uh, OECD uh, advanced industrial countries, uh, the United States, Canada, Japan, most of Western Europe. Um, the, uh, 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 they're much richer, that's um, in a sense why they're sort of called the global north, um, and they're a much smaller part of the popu world population than the global south, which is poorer, although richer than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, it's been catching up to the global north uh, in terms of both GDP and GDP per capita, um, and, uh, but it's much, uh, a much larger slice of the world's population uh, than the global north. So I want to uh, in differentiate a little bit between these two because they've been experiencing globalization slightly differently. The North globalized first, it's globalized more in some dimensions um, than the Global South. But the Global South has been catching up very recently. Um, the, uh, uh, the history of this is, is kind of interesting. If in the 1970s and 80s you would have asked people would we have seen the developing countries, in a, in a sense, join the world economy fully and uh, voluntarily? I think most people would have answered no. The expectation simply was that the developing world was pretty close to trade. It was pretty close to capital flows. Um, uh, they were more interested in uh, labor flows and migration, but they weren't interested in opening up in these other dimensions. Um, they were following this policy of import substituting industrialization by and large, and there was very little interest in opening up. Um, what, uh, what happened over time, um, obviously with the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the Eastern European bloc opens up and uh, joins the world economy and the European economy. Um, and then uh, over time, as Asia uh, and many Asian countries liberalize and open up, um, the rest of the developing countries start following this process. And over time, um, you see this uh, uh, wave kind of moving from Asia, Eastern Europe, uh, all across the developing world. Um, and the, the Global North, in effect, starts this um, in the 70s and 80s, this process. And then it is followed by these waves of different developing countries uh, uh, moving beyond it. But this was very unexpected at the time. Uh, and many of us wrote in sort of political economy that we didn't think that uh, these countries were actually um, going to be interested in or willing or able to uh, join the world economy. Uh, most of us were, were wrong at that, uh, about that expectation. 
Um, the, uh, the other history that's important to remember that I referred to a little bit earlier is the last period of globalization, which was the late 19th century. Um, and this period experienced, again, a very pronounced imp uh, uh, growth in, in trade, in capital flows, as well as migration. And in fact, migration and labor mobility was much greater in the late 19th century than it's been uh, any time since then, um, and probably from any time it will ever be. Um, uh, and uh, as you know, um, this all ended uh, pretty badly in World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II, uh, when there was this closure um, and uh, 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 the end of globalization. Um, the different dimensions of globalization, let me just talk through a couple of those, um, trade, capital flows, and the labor flows, um, and show you sort of what's happened recently. Uh, in, uh, in trade, this is, uh, I, I find this chart actually very interesting. It goes from 1500, the best data we have on what's been happening, mostly in trade here. Um, and what you can see is that the world was pretty closed, pretty divided until uh, the late 19th century when you get this first burst of globalization, right after the first industrial revolution. Uh, and then it begins to um, take off. Uh, you then have the interwar period in which everything uh, closes up again. And then you have this taking off uh, again after uh, 1945, 1950, uh, and, and trade really opening up. So we live in a very, very different world than most of human history uh, with this very globalized world that we're seeing now. Uh, this is trade for a much shorter period of time. Again, the developed countries um, are less dependent on trade than the developing countries, but everybody has grown more dependent on trade, and especially since this period from the end of the Cold War up to the financial crisis, the developing world really opened up um, and became part of the world economy uh, in, in trade. And as I'll try and show you later, um, they seem to have benefited very uh, substantially from this opening uh, to trade. Um, this is just to show you that world exports and trade grew much faster than world GDP for most of this period. Trade has been a major engine of growth um, over, over the last two or three decades. Uh, well, even before then, but certainly over the last two or three decades. Uh, it's been a, a big driver of all the growth that we've seen. Um, this is a look at the top exporters, and, and the ones in red basically show you that in 1970, it looked, um, you know, it's the United States, Japan, and Western Europe are the big uh, exporters as a percentage of total world exports. Um, and if you look now, what you're seeing is China up on top and South Korea and Hong Kong coming in, the Asian countries becoming uh, global trading powers. In terms of importing, um, you're seeing m many of the same patterns from a pattern where it's the United States, uh, Japan, and Europe uh, to one where you've gotten a number of the Asian countries, including now India, as being a major trading uh, uh, country. And I would assume that in, uh, if, if patterns continue in 20 or 30 years, you're going to see uh, most of those uh, uh, charts being filled with, with the Asian countries as, as the major trading powers. Global capital flows, um, these also increased very substantially, but what you'll notice is that global capital flows as a percentage of world sort of GDP is much, much smaller than trade. Even after all the opening, it's something like two or three or four percent of global GDP, whereas trade is way up at 70 or 80 percent of, of global GDP. Trade is just a much, much bigger factor. Now, global capital flows can also have big, big influences, you will understand, from the global financial crisis um, and uh, the, the enormous impact that that crisis had on, on different economies. But trade is a much, much bigger uh, factor in the world economy um, than than these other uh, flows. But you'll also notice here that um, while the black dotted line is overall flows, this orange line is foreign direct investment. And foreign inve direct investment has become a major um, factor in the growth, again, of the developing world. And many of the developing countries opened up to foreign direct investment um, in this time period, especially after the end of the Cold War. Um, and uh, a big driver of their growth has been foreign direct investment from the developed countries, by and large. Um, it is now starting to be the case that there's much more south-south investment 
uh, especially as China um, uh, advances. Uh, but it's largely been developed foreign, uh, foreign direct investment from de developed countries into the developing ones that has uh, been a major driver, again, of growth in this period. Um, these, uh, again, this is foreign direct uh, inflows, um, and what you'll see is that um, since the end of the Cold War, um, the developing country's portion of that has been growing, and after the financial crisis, it really um, becomes a major, major portion of those inflows uh, as the developing countries um, look like the better investment uh, uh, opportunity for, for many investors. Um, FDI outflows uh, are still very heavily dominated by the developed countries, um, but the developing countries are starting, as I mentioned, and China, with its Belt and Road Initiative, is going to be a big player in all of this uh, over time if, uh, if trends, present trends, continue. Um, and here again are some of the changes in these FDI outflows uh, over time from uh, the 1970s to 2017. And again, what you see is um, the Asian countries, especially China, moving in. The British Virgin Islands, this is an interesting case. Um, uh, as many of you know, one thing that's accompanied global capital flows is the tax havens. Um, and. Uh, BVI is a tax haven. A lot of foreign investment is booked through uh, the BVI as, as well as a number of other countries. And when you look at these foreign investment statistics, you have to be very careful because these tax havens now, um, and the Netherlands is another one. Um, it's not that you know they've got an enormous economy and they're getting tons and tons of uh, manufacturing investment. They're uh, one of these uh, places where a lot of companies are booking their foreign investment and their profits and repatriation to take advantage of tax uh, 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 rules um, and then move the money uh, elsewhere. Um, outflows, uh, again, are, are inflows, um, again, uh, movement into the Asian countries very strongly. And you see the world economy, again, moving kind of toward the east in terms of its uh, magnitude. Um, this is uh, foreign uh, aid. Um, I wanted to show this as a flow. Foreign aid is um, a, a substantial flow in terms of capital flows, but much less than foreign investment. Uh, it goes mostly to the poorest of the poor, um, and it's been, uh, it hasn't changed very substantially. Um, this is uh, as a percent of the donors, uh, basically their um, entire economies. It stayed a pretty small percentage. The uh, goal has been way up here at almost 1%. We've never gotten anywhere close to that uh, among the donor countries uh, in terms of actually meeting their commitments. Um, international migration, uh, migrants um, in terms of population uh, have, been, uh, have been growing over time. Um, uh, and uh, this has been, um, actually, the economists think that the biggest thing that the developed countries could do to help the developing countries would be to free migration. As you well realize, politically, that is simply impossible. Um, and uh, if we wanted to really help the developing world, that's probably what we'd do. Um, but uh, that's not at all likely to be the thing that uh, we end up doing. Um, and this is just to show you that, again, migrants are concentrated in the developed countries, with a growing share of the developed country populations um, uh, being made up of migrants. Uh, which may be one reason why you're seeing some of this backlash, although it's not as bad as you would think, right? We're only talking uh, 12, 13, 14, 15 percent of these economies. We're not talking anywhere near 50 percent or, or what a lot of political parties are suggesting in terms of the size of migration. Um, remittances, again, changing um, uh, very substantially who's sending them and who's uh, giving them. Um, and the recipients, uh, again, uh, changing uh, over time as we see things. Um, let me say, uh, let me talk a bit about uh, the uh, conditions making globalization possible uh, in this period. So, so why um, in the uh, late 1980s and 1990s do we get this big change in policy? One of the things that I and a number of other people have argued is that it was democracy and democratization itself that led to um, op this opening that we saw in both the developed and the developing countries. Um, and the other thing that we've talked about is the kind of political will to change policies, economic policies, uh, for a variety of reasons, as well as U.S. leadership um, and the role of international institutions, uh, such as the IMF and the World Bank and the WTO, 
um, and finding technological change that just undergirded globalization and made it uh, much easier uh, as the costs of uh, actually moving goods and services and people and capital decreased very, very substantially. Uh, the interesting question I think to ask about these sources is um, have most of them, uh, uh, um, are, they, do they, are they persisting or are most of them kind of changing in ways? Um, and certainly I would say that uh, the third one, that global governance and U.S. leadership are uh, going in the opposite direction now um, uh, and making uh, further globalization uh, much less likely. Um, so we saw a number of democratic transitions in this period, especially around the end of the Cold War, um, with Eastern Europe and a number of other countries transitioning. Um, and this is uh, the green uh, uh, bars are, are the number of transitions per year to democracy. Uh, the line is the rising polity score, which is this score of democracy. And you see it rising over time. Uh, what you do see again is it flattening out, and I would imagine in the future you're going to see this line starting actually to decline as countries become uh, in some ways less democratic. Um, as I said, I had a number of papers and uh, research projects that really looked at uh, what led to uh, this trade liberalization that we saw all across the world. Um, and one of the things was democratization, which preceded trade liberalization in many countries. Um, and this is basically a graph that sort of shows the correlation over time between democratization um, and tariffs. And what you'll see is that um, from 1970 to about 2015, um, there's a negative relationship the whole time, meaning that more democracy leads to lower tariffs around the world, but that this increases very substantially after 1990. And this is the big boom in globalization and openness that we see in the developing world. Um, there are also a number of policy choices that led countries to, uh, to globalize um, and to liberalize. Uh, many of them um, uh, were sort of com uh, competitive pressures. Uh, the desire for foreign investment uh, after they saw uh, a lot of Asian countries getting foreign investment and wondering what to do about it. The desire then to be part of these global value chains that many of the multinational corporations had started developing and they saw um, these global value chains and still see them as a, a major way of increasing their ability to uh, industrialize uh, and, and do so in an efficient fashion. Uh, imitation of the Asian success stories that went on through the 80s and 90s uh, earlier uh, here, as well as pressure from the international financial institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, and to some extent the WTO. Um, so uh, again, um, these are tariff rates uh, going down over time. Um, uh, this is the developing world, which has got, still got higher tariffs. Uh, 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 this is the developed world, uh, very low tariffs now. Um, actually, they're starting to go up in part because of the United States uh, and the trade war that's currently going on. Um, capital account openness, we also see very dramatic increases in this over time uh, as both the developed and the developing world uh, liberalize their capital markets. Uh, Low-skilled immigration policy, this is liberalization of those policies. Um, and you're, you saw over this period um, a very substantial uh, liberalization, um, uh, mostly in, in earlier times, but again, even some in this current period. Uh, in terms of global governance, there's been, um, as you know, um, many, many international government, governmental organizations that were created uh, since World War II. Uh, there have been many NGOs, non-governmental organizations created as well. Many of these institutions were to help with uh, uh, economic globalization um, and to try and help countries deal with uh, development uh, in a globalized world. Um, uh, these kind of help manage some of the externalities from globalization. We've seen many challenges to these over time. Uh, this is just uh, the rise in the number that we've seen over time in both these institutions. Um, and uh, uh, they've, uh, in a sense, helped uh, uh, make, allow countries, enable countries to cooperate more. Uh, and you can think about the EU as, as a primary case of this, right? because the EU as an IGO uh, has been a major source of cooperation among countries to kind of deal with globalization as well as to foster globalization, to manage globalization. 
um, and uh, it's been one of the uh, one of the regional um, uh, forces for doing this since um, since the 1990s and especially since the WTO formation um, uh, what we've seen is um, the rise of preferential trade agreements as another means uh, around the world for managing globalization and for fostering globalization we've also seen bilateral investment treaties for capital markets um, and we've seen a number of labor uh, agreements as well to, in a sense, liberalize what you saw those uh, liberalizing migration. Um, these are, again, just to show you um, that these uh, agreements, these are the trade agreements, the numbers uh, per year, uh, and then the cumulative numbers and percentage uh, of trade that's being managed by these uh, global institutions. Um, uh, this is uh, bilateral investment treaties, uh, again, on the capital side and their growth over time. Um, and these are these migration agreements, and they've been growing over time uh, as uh, liberalizing labor flows. In terms of technological change, um, we've seen an enormous speeding up in uh, the different types of technologies and how fast they're adopted. So uh, electricity, for 25% of the U.S. population to have electricity, it took uh, almost 45 years. Uh, for 25% of the American population to have smartphones, it took about four years. So you're just seeing this dramatic shortening of the time cycle for technological change to diffuse. Um, this is another dramatic chart where you saw, see declining um, costs of transportation. Uh, and, and here again, um, just very dramatic declines in the costs uh, of computers, uh, in the costs of airfares, telephone conversations, freight rates. Most of uh, trade goes by fr sea freight. Um, and so you can just see that um, you know, these, these uh, costs of this uh, kind of globalization have been coming down very, very rapidly. Many people claim that because of this technological change, globalization is irreversible. I'm not sure that's the case. I think the technological change will keep occurring, but globalization is supported and managed and, and fostered by political uh, uh, forces and by policies. Um, and if those policies change, you may still see the technology, but you may not see the kind of uh, open borders that, that we've seen in the past. Again, uh, declining world trade costs very substantially over the past 150 years. Um, uh, this is the introduction of robots, and I kind of like this um, because uh, we always think that developed countries are the ones uh, adopting fastest. What this tells you is that the developing countries, look at that, look at that increase in the robots in the developing world. This is the developed world, the red line, and a lot of this is China. Even though China has an enormous uh, labor supply, right? They're adopting robots, industrial robots, at a faster rate than probably anybody in the rest of the world, um, which should probably tell you something about the future. <laughs> um, so let me turn now to some of the economic and political effects of globalization. Um, the, uh, the, I think there are positive and negative uh, uh, consequences of globalization, and I don't want you to completely forget the positive ones, um, because I'm going to focus a bit more on kind of uh, some of the negative ones. But I think globalization has been associated with um, uh, development and growth in the developing world. Uh, and I'll show you some, some charts on that. With progress toward many of the m Millennium Development Goals, and I'll show you just a little bit on that. Um, it has also had um, negative uh, uh, repercussions uh, in the sense that while if you think about um, equality on a global scale, that is just by people, the world, as I'll show you, has become more equal. If you think about globalization uh, and uh, within countries and inequality within countries, what you'll see is that uh, countries have become more unequal. Uh, many countries have become more unequal uh, globally. And then there are the political consequences, which I think uh, uh, are also have some uh, increasingly negative kind of aspects to them. So um, this is just GDP and GDP growth rates uh, over time. Um, what you'll see is that um, for most of the period, there's been about a, a two, three percent sort of average growth rate with a lot of moving around because that's kind of what capitalism does is go up and down. Um, but there has been this pretty steady growth rate during the period on average uh, 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 for the world um, uh, in this period. Um, 
The uh, Millennium Development Goals, um, they've talked about a number of these goals, poverty, uh, ending hunger, education for all, sanitation, electricity. I can show you that there's been progress made on each of these, but let me just um, look at the one on poverty, because I think in some ways this is the most basic and sort of important one. Um, and what you'll see is there's been fairly steady progress on this goal, and there's been some of the some most substantial progress during the period of highest globalization. And as many of you know, um, uh, uh, hundreds and thousands of people have come out of poverty in China, uh, and to some extent in India, to some extent in, in Latin America, less so in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but there has been a very steady progress on this, uh, some of which has been attributed to globalization. Um, but it hasn't been the case that globalization has been associated with rising poverty in the world. It's gone the other direction, as is true for many of these other Millennium Development Goals. Uh, world inequality, um, uh, as I said, um, considering the world, considering just the world population, that's actually gotten better. Uh, within country inequality has gotten worse in many countries. Um, this is, uh, again, I think this is an interesting chart. So this is. Uh, income per citizen in the world per year, um, and this is uh, millions of people. Um, uh, uh, further out to, to the right is, is better because it's richer, um, and higher is better because it means more of the people are massed at that position. What you've seen is that 1820 is the red line, um, very few rich people out here. Uh, 1970, you're getting a few more uh, rich because um, you're getting out here. 2000, you're, you're moving people substantially to the right and to the uh, uh, more, uh, to the sort of you know, wealthier, less poor category. Um, you still have a substantial inequality because you're getting a fairly a large number of people out here, but you are getting, uh, uh, again, wealthier pe people in general. Um, this is what many people talk about, though, that is worrisome, which is the distribution of growth over this period. Um, and what you've seen is that the poorest people um, have actually had pretty uh, substantial growth rates. Um, up to about the 70th percentile. This is of the whole world population. Um, the problem is that this group in here, this is the lower and middle and uh, working class and, and middle income class in the advanced industrial countries. This is the European uh, working class, uh, uh, American middle class, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the problem is they have not seen the growth over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and that's where we get into some of these political issues. I can talk about economic crises. Actually, crises of a numbers of sorts are down um, in this period. Uh, uh, but the big crisis we had was even bigger than many of the other ones. So um, let me turn now to um, just talk a little bit about sort of democracy and globalization and the challenges that we face on the political front uh, from globalization. Um, and I think what people have noticed is that there's been a rise in, in extreme parties um, and extreme party platforms and extreme party vote shares uh, in, in the advanced industrial countries, uh, especially in Europe. Um, uh, uh, what I'll show you is that we've seen it in a number of different areas. We've seen the growth in party platforms that are anti-internationalist, uh, anti-elitist, anti-establishment, um, uh, kind of more xenophobic, more national, natis, nationalist, more nativist. Uh, we've seen it in the sense of an increased share of votes for extreme right parties. Um, and we've seen it in the uh, a kind of a relationship between trade, especially, uh, and the rise of these uh, uh, kind of parties, uh, uh, these kind of party platforms, and these kind of uh, changing vote shares. Um, I don't want to get into a long discussion on what populism is, because I think it's a, it's a contested uh, concept. Um, I think there are elements of populism that we see on the extreme right and the extreme left. Um, they include things like nativism, uh, a bit of uh, anti-elitism, uh, some authoritarianism even, uh, this anti-cosmopolitan, anti-internationalist series of sentiments. Um, and so while people differ on the exact definition of pop posit uh, populism, um, I think that there are these kind of inherent elements that we see, and we see them on the, uh, in, in many of the extreme right parties, and to some extent uh, in, in extreme left, but less so.
Um, there are a number of papers now that are looking at um, the relationship between uh, populism uh, and globalization. Um, these are just some of them, uh, the kind of uh, uh, early ones and, and some of the more famous ones. I'm going to be um, talking about sort of some of the things that they talk about. Um, what they've uh, emphasized is that uh, globalization in terms of trade seems to have had this impact that I showed you on uh, uh, the wages and jobs for the middle class, uh, working the working class in the advanced industrial countries of Europe and the United States. Uh, and that uh, both in terms of cutting down on jobs uh, and slowing wage growth, um, trade, especially trade from China and trade from the developing world, uh, seems to be associated with this, with this impact. Uh, and, and we think that part of the response then of the public has been to this uh, process to, uh, to look for new parties, new ideas, uh, new ways to deal with this. Um, one of the, the interesting queries is why aren't people who are affected this way by trade, um, by capital flows, why aren't they moving to the left? The left has traditionally promised um, protection for labor in terms of uh, regulation. It's promised uh, bigger social welfare states, more job training. It's been um, very much on the compensation side. Um, the left parties uh, have been much stronger than the right parties. And uh, interestingly enough, for many, many, many years in this period, the right parties have been pro-free trade, or more pro-free trade than the left parties have been. So it's, it looks like a real puzzle as to why you're getting these groups of uh, voters turning to the extreme right rather than turning to the left. Um, and people are, um, most of the research nowadays is trying to figure out why we're getting this kind of reaction. Um, so, uh, to, to kind of look a little bit at this, um, what I want to talk about is uh, first kind of the political party backlash and what you're seeing. Um, and, and again, it's very hard to disentangle whether voters are becoming more attracted to the program of extreme right parties or the extreme right parties are offering new programs that are attracting voters away from the left to the extreme right. It's hard to tell whether this is a push or a pull in some sense. Um, it's probably a combination of both, that there are voters out there who are very dissatisfied, you know, disenchanted to use Weber's term, with the existing parties and they're looking for new ideas. And there are then policy entrepreneurs um, who are out there, uh, like Mr. Salvini, um, who are uh, offering programs that seem attractive to those uh, uh, voters nowadays. Um, but those party programs, one of the questions is, are they turning against globalization? Uh, are they turning against the EU and international governance? Are they turning sort of toward nationalism, nativism, xenophobia? Um, and the answer is kind of yes. Um, so here is, uh, again, over time, um, from the comparative party manifestos data, looking at those different categories, what's sort of happening, and increases here are uh, moves toward anti-internationalism, nativism, nationalism, um, all those uh, sort of different uh, uh, categories. And what you're seeing is that um, it, it declined in this period up to the end of the Cold War. It's sort of flat, but then it starts to, to rise um, from 1995 on. It's still the case that overall, because we're below zero, um, that EU, uh, this is uh, European parties, that European parties by and large are still pro-Europe, pro-internationalism. Um, they're not all pro-populist, it's just that there's a movement in this direction. And I would imagine that this, uh, the, when you add the new European uh, elections to this, you're going to see even further movement. Um, this is a look at some civil and political rights, and um, while there's still, uh, we saw increases in those civil and political rights over time, we're now seeing the flattening out and even the uh, decreases in these things. Uh, this is censorship um, and uh, media censorship and internet censorship, and you're starting to see even more of that over time uh, as these, these things start trending down, actually. Um, this graph is uh, always a little bit scary to me. Um, again, uh, this is um, the uh, main right parties. This is the main left parties. Vote shares in European elections from 1970 to uh, 2015. Uh, this is extreme, uh, the extreme left, and this is the extreme right. And what you can see is the extreme right and the center left are getting very close to one another. 
Um, and uh, this is one of the things that uh, is interesting to try and explain what's happening here in terms of vote shares. Um, so uh, a lot of, as I said, people have looked at the globalization backlash and they've uh, tried to track where exactly uh, globalization is hit specifically because we think it's specific areas, not just overall countries, uh, but the specific regions and locales within uh, European countries and uh, the United States that have been hit by, the global, by globalization. And we want to see whether it's those areas that are the ones with people shifting uh, from the center left mainly to the extreme right. Um, and so, uh, when you look at this, um, uh, what you'll see is, um, here is the uh, imports from outside the OECD. So this is low wage imports uh, and their increase over time. Um, and what you can see is, again, from about 1995 on, they're moving forward. Um, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Thanks, it's an ad. <laughs> uh, yes, well, uh, <laughs> thank you, Google or somebody. Um, this is, again, imports from China, and you can see this huge surge, again, uh, as China joins the WTO in 2001, uh, and you get this very strong surge in all countries across Europe. Um, this is the China shock. This is what I just showed you, uh, but graphically. And what you can see is it's affecting the big industrial heartlands of Europe, uh, Dutch, uh, Belgian, French heartlands, German heartlands, and part of uh, uh, UK, Ireland. Um, uh, Italy, interestingly, is not that affected by the, by the China shock, um, but uh, uh, you'll see uh, in other areas it does get affected. This is just to show you that it's affecting all sorts of industries across Europe. These are all sorts of different industries from leather goods to textiles to electronic goods um, with these big, big increases in, uh, in imports uh, over time. Um, this is deindustrialization in Europe. And what you'll see is, again, that there's been a pretty steady deindustrialization. This is the percentage of the workforce in Europe that is in manufacturing. Um, and many people think that the China shock and the trade shocks have been a, a driver of this deindustrialization. The only problem with that is that it starts way before the China shock. Um, so while the China shock is probably part of this, it's not the whole story. And here's the deindustrialization. And again, there's, there's a big chunk right there, which I assume is kind of Milan, uh, the, the, it, the northern Italian uh, sort of industrial complex in part. Um, this is changes in migrant shares, and this is where Italy gets hit. Big change in uh, migrant shares in Italy in the, in the last uh, 10 years. Um, uh, so let me just uh, uh, kind of, I probably should conclude pretty soon. So let me just start sort of um, showing you just a little bit on what we find when we look at, uh, when we try and correlate uh, a whole series of economic globalization factors uh, trade, robots, the introduction of robots, foreign investment, migrants, uh, with a number of other controls, what we get in terms of uh, their effect on uh, vote shares. So what you'll see here is that trade, this is the, the red dots across here, um, are right populist parties or right ex extreme right parties and these are extreme left parties. Um, the extreme left is not getting affected by much of this. And this is, again, kind of an interesting puzzle. But the extreme right is gaining vote share with trade. Uh, and it's gaining vote share as you introduce robots into those regions, in those particular regions I was showing you. This is at a, a much more disaggregated level. Um, this is the uh, center, center right and center left. And what you'll see is that the center left is getting hurt by trade. And it's these center left voters that are probably fleeing to the center, uh, to the extreme right. And that's the puzzle that everybody's trying to explain. Um, so let me, let me do one thing um, before I close. Uh, and let me just, let me go around the room and ask you to vote on these uh, questions. So, and then let me show you the reaction of other countries uh, to these, uh, their, their votes on these things. So is trade good? Do you think that growing trade and business ties between your country and other countries are a very good thing, a somewhat good thing, a bad thing, or a very bad thing? So how about everybody who thinks it's very good or good, somewhat good, raise your hands, and then everybody who thinks it's bad or somewhat bad, raise your hands. Let me sort of estimate what I think the percentage is. So everybody who thinks it's somewhat good or good or very good, raise your hand. 
So I would say like, what, 60, 70 percent? Yeah, that's a, that's a good percent. Bad. Somewhat bad, any, any bad? A couple of people. Okay, so maybe it's... <laughs> Okay, so overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly trade is good. Does trade create jobs in your country or make no difference? So trade creates jobs. Well, okay. Trade, trade destroys jobs in your country. A few people, okay, a few more people, but still okay. Uh, trade, does trade increase wages in your country? Yes, wages increase. Ooh, very few people. Trade decreases wages or has no effect. More people. But, well, my, yeah, we're, we're tipping now. Um, does trade decrease prices of goods in your country? Decrease prices. Okay, everybody pretty much. Trade increases prices. Pretty much nobody. So this is, um, this is those same questions. Um, this is the view in the United States in uh, 2018. This is the view in the advanced industrial world. That's Europe, pretty much. This is the emerging countries. Um, so you're pretty much in line with everybody. The, even in the United States, the vast majority, three quarters of the population, think it's, uh, trade, is, trade is good. Um, in terms of trade creates jobs, though, you're much more on the positive side than the rest of the world, even including the uh, emerging world. Um, and in terms of increasing wages, well, the, you know, you're getting closer to what the rest of the world thinks. In terms of decreasing prices, nobody seems to realize it decreases prices. Um, uh, so uh, they're slightly different. Um, but overall, um, at least on, on this big question, you can see that there is still a pretty strong sentiment across the world. The other thing that's interesting to note is that the emerging countries tend to be more positive. Uh, and you'll see this again. Um, this is uh, GDP per capita. And this is uh, globalization is a force for good, the percentage. And what you'll see is that um, the richer the country, uh, well, the, the, this is the change in GDP per capita. So the, in, in some ways, the poorer the country, but the faster the growth, the more, they're, more positive they are on globalization. Um, and again, this is, is, uh, is trade, a, you know, the TPP was it a good thing. Uh, most of the uh, developing countries are very positive. As you get down here, uh, more developed get less positive. Uh, again, is trade a force for good? Um, the developing country is very positive. The developing country is, the developed country is less and less positive. So you're seeing a complete switch in many ways. Um, this is parties in, in Europe and things like that, um, which I won't talk about. Um, so let me just turn to the conclusions. Um, what I wanted to show you was that globalization advanced very rapidly for a period of about 20 or 30 years from the late 1980s. Uh, it's slowed since then, and my bet would be that you're going to see ever more slowing of that trend. Um, what you had was an enormous China shock and a low-wage growth uh, 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 trade shock as well in, uh, in the period in the 2000s after China and a number of other countries joined the WTO. Um, European parties in particular um, and other and U.S. Uh, 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 parties have turned more and more against trade, although all of them remain um, pretty much pro-internationalist still, uh, pro-EU, but they're turning um, and you're seeing more of this and more parties emerge, new parties emerge that um, have these uh, kind of uh, uh, anti-internationalist components to them. You're seeing rising vote shares for the extreme right, and you're seeing declining vote shares for the center left. Uh, and that shift in vote shares is a very interesting and puzzling thing to explain. You're seeing public opinion in the global north around globalization becoming less and less supportive in some ways. Um, and you're seeing public opinion in the developing world and the global south being very supportive of trade uh, and foreign investment by and large. I've done a number of surveys in developing countries and um, a, 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 you know, nationally representative surveys of the publics there. And in many of them, they're very, very positive on trade and foreign investment, uh, much more so than you'll get in many of the uh, uh, developed countries. Um, and the question, I think, is, um, uh, uh, is globalization going to stall or be reversed? Are we going to see a period like the interwar period? 
um, and is democracy at risk as well? Because as you'll remember, in that interwar period, democracy suffered very badly as well, as country after country turned um, fascist or communist, um, and the, de demo the democratic uh, world sort of uh, uh, shrunk very dramatically. Uh, and we had uh, to recover democracy basically after uh, the end of the Second World War. So um, uh, I don't think technological change makes globalization irreversible. It certainly is going to change our world in the future and make some of these problems and uh, issues even worse. Um, because what we're seeing is that um, if you look at uh, the type of jobs that can be most easily automated, it's again that middle group uh, that is the most affected by it. The low skill group tends to be um, affected by it, but often not as much because many low skilled services are ones where you really do need people in them. Um, and many high skilled services are ones where you really do need people in them. And so again, it's this middle group. Um, as Barrington Moore wrote many, many years ago, no middle class, no democracy. Um, it's a worry that both um, globalization and technological change seem to be affecting this middle class group. Um, and uh, uh, I think that's uh, one of the uh, big issues that we have to face as we move forward. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I look forward to your questions.